going to take your Bible. I'd like you to turn to page one. That's where we started last week. But I just glanced, and uh, the Pew Bible, the Church Bible, if you're using that, is not page one, it's page 957, because I want to go to the first page of the New Testament. So turn to Matthew 1, and if you're using the Church Bible there, it's page 957, Matthew 1. And as Mike pointed out, we're in the middle of this series where we're looking at Jesus, the seed of the woman, the promised one, the proto-evangelium, the fathers used to say, the first proclamation of the gospel we looked at last week, the last Adam. Adam got us into a mess. Jesus, the last Adam, is our great head of a new race. All who are born into Adam die. All who are born into the last Adam, Jesus Christ, born again into, Ad, into this Adam, this Christ, have life eternal. And today, Matthew 1, verse 1, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. That's today. This morning, we're going to look at the son of Abraham. And tonight, Pastor Dozier will teach us regarding the son of David. Now, the Old Testament, the Bible, in fact, it's good that I looked and it's page 957 because there's an awful lot of Old Testament before you get to the New Testament. And the Bible is full of promises. We looked at the first promise. And it's full of types or images, or foreshadowings, because the Holy Spirit was not content to merely tell us about Jesus when he got here, although he did give us four Gospels, not just one, four books that we call Gospel, good news. Behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, we say this time of year, because that's what the angels announced. But the Holy Spirit, from the beginning of the book, began to tell us about this one. And the Bible is just full of this anticipation, and you'll hear it in Christmas music. Uh, listen this season. In fact, it's not bad to just take them out and think them through, the lyrics of the Christmas music. You know, come thou long expected Jesus. There's this anticipation that builds and so when you come to the first verse of the New Testament, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, uh, I want us to take a look, a close look at this matter of Jesus, the son of Abraham. I'm going to move you around in the Bible just to keep your hands warm today since it's 14 now. Turn to Galatians 3. I want you to look at Galatians 3, about two-thirds of the way back in the New Testament. Galatians 3. Because, you know, I, I, I mentioned that last week when he said, in the middle of the curse, <laughs> he made this amazing promise, and we call it the first proclamation of the gospel. Well, Galatians chapter 3 tells us the Scripture, verse 8 foreseeing that God would ju justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. The Scripture, knowing what God was going to do, the Holy Spirit preached the gospel to Abraham ahead of time. And Jesus, when he came, was very aware of this. I think of uh, the dynamic when you think of these titles of Jesus. You know, he said to the guys one time, not to the guys, I shouldn't say, not like his guys. He said it to his antagonists. He said, whose son is the Messiah? Oh, that was easy. They said, David's son. You can read it in Matthew 22. We'll probably look at it tonight. David's son. He says, well, then how is it that David called him Lord? And then he quoted, the Lord said to my Lord. David called 
him Lord. What's the deal? And Jesus was very aware of this. So that he said, when they were saying, well, we're children of Abraham. And he said, listen, if you were children of Abraham, you'd do the deeds of Abraham. And you remember that debate in John 8. And finally he said, you know, Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. And they said, what? You're not yet 50 years old and you're saying you've seen Abraham? And Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am. And they knew exactly what he was claiming. I am that I am. Who do I tell them that you are, Moses said at the burning bush. And he revealed himself as the great I am. And Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am. And they knew what he was saying. And they had a choice to make, just like you and I do today. And they picked up stones to stone him. Now, Abraham is a huge player in the Bible. Uh, he's called the father of all who believe. If you're a believer today, you can say Father Abraham. He's the father of all who believe, Romans 4. Three times in the Bible, he's called the friend of God. As far as I know, he's the only one that's specifically called that. We're called friends, but uh, he was called the friend of God. Paul and James both use him as the example of faith. Paul in Romans 4 says he's the, he's the prototype of how you lay hold of Jesus Christ. You believe God. You take him at his word. And we are justified just like Abraham was by faith apart from works, apart from rituals. He wasn't even circumcised at the time. Apart from any kind of religious ceremony, Abraham put his faith in the God who raises the dead. And uh, he amplifies it all through the, right at the heart of the gospel in Romans chapter 4. And James picks up on it in chapter 2 of James and says, that kind of faith that is without works, that is without ritual, that kind of faith will always produce changed lives and works and obedience. So you've got uh, a lot of New Testament material to look at, and we're not going to look at it. I'm just kind of letting you know. Uh, you go to the chapter on faith, Hebrews 11. And by far, that's a fairly long chapter, lots of people mentioned, but by far the longest section in chapter 11 of Hebrews, speaking of faith, is devoted to Abraham. In fact, uh, turn there, Hebrews 11. Now, <clears throat> verse we're jumping into the middle because he started talking about Abraham's faith back in verse 8. But I'm going to have you look at verse 17 in just a moment. But uh, we're not here really to talk about Abraham. <laughs> the title today and the theme, Jesus, the son of Abraham. The New Testament speaks of the seed, not seeds, not descendants. Galatians says, remember he said seed, singular, the seed of Abraham, the son of David, and uh, the son of promise, not Ishmael, but Isaac. So if you know your New Testament, you've heard some of this, and I want to kind of tie it together, but we want to look now at the son of Abraham, verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. He considered that God is able to raise men even from the dead, from which he also received him back as a type. A parable. Uh, we looked at this whole concept last Sunday night as we looked at Jesus as the last Adam. Adam was a type. Uh, the Bible uses this term to speak of the image that's left. And the real thing left the image, okay? And in the Old Testament, 
Bible teachers call these things types. They're foreshadowings of the real thing. And Adam was a negative type <laughs> by one act. Adam messed up everybody born into Adam. But Jesus, by one act of righteousness, gives life and justification to all born into him. He is the last Adam. And there are many, many types and images. Uh, it's the word that Thomas used when he said, I've got to put my hand, my finger in, in the, the images, the, the scars left by the nails in Jesus' hand. So that's what we're looking at here. Uh, he says that Abraham, when he offered up Isaac, he was offering up his only begotten son. And he did so knowing that the book said, God had said, in Isaac your seed will be called. And verse 19, he considered, he realized, he thought it through, and he realized that God is able to raise men even from the dead, from which he received him back, figuratively speaking. Now, what I want to do is go back and take a good look at that. That's found in Genesis. Let's go back to the beginning. Genesis 22. When you think about the role Abraham plays in the book, uh, Genesis, the first 11 chapters, covers an awful lot of ground. But at chapter 12 and onward, it zeroes in this book of beginnings on Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph. The rest of the book, 40 chapters worth, zeroing in on this man, Abraham. And we want to look at what Hebrews referenced, chapter 22. And uh, I'll tell you what, when we look at this, we're looking at, uh, it's like examining a fine piece of art. The Holy Spirit, when he comes, Jesus said, when he comes, I'm going to leave you, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. When he comes, he will take of mine and disclose it to you. He will glorify me. The Holy Spirit today in your life and in my life and in this room, he wants to magnify and it is his delight to focus our attention on Jesus Christ. And help us to see the beauty of the image of the invisible God, Jesus. And so, during these weeks, my prayer is that we will see him. And as I said, he wasn't content to wait till the New Testament. He wrote the Old Testament through Moses and a variety of authors, always weaving a tapestry that points to Jesus Christ. And so what we're going to do is we just look at this picture that the New Testament says is just that, a type, an image, a foreshadowing. What we want to do is take a look at it and realize that we're looking at the sun. Now, there's many points of correspondence. Uh, I'll give you 10 between the son of Abraham and the son of Abraham. When Abraham offered up his son... And then when the father offered up the son of Abraham. Uh, I'll give you ten points of correspondence. There are more. In fact, and then I'm going to give you a huge contrast. And then we'll give an eleventh point of correspondence. Uh, read it with me. Now it came about... After these things, that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. And offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. 
Now, let me just say at the outset here, there's two tracks, and we'll look at both. This is a real account of the test of Abraham's faith and what a test it is. It's an amazing test. And there's this other side of it that the Bible points our attention to, that it's a picture. And the Bible gives many pictures. Joseph's life is a picture of the one who really will be the savior of the world, who was rejected by his brother and thrown in a pit, sold for pieces of silver, and ended up being the rescuer of Israel. Joseph is a picture of Jesus. There are many, many pictures, okay? So we're going to be looking at it in both ways. This picture of the son of Abraham is meant to draw our attention to the coming son, the son of Abraham, but it never contradicts or spoils the passion of the real story, too. And so I won't comment a lot on what's going on in Abraham's heart. I won't have to as we watch this unfold. But I will say that God never uh, uses them in, you know, he weaves history in such a way that everything should ultimately and does ultimately point to man's great need of deliverance in Jesus Christ. So let's take a look at it. And notice the first, uh, first two verses that I read, I mean, it's amazing. He, he says, I want you to take your son, your only son, your son whom you love, Isaac, and offer him up. It's an amazing test of Abraham's faith. And we see right away, and by the way, if you glance over at verse 16, he reiterates this. After this scene is over, he said, your son, your only son, you did not withhold. So he says it purposefully and intentionally. First point of correspondence. He didn't say to Abraham, I want you to take your livestock, your goats, your calves, your lambs. Uh uh. Take your son. God gave his son. Not all the money in the world. We weren't redeemed with silver and gold. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The blood of bulls and goats can never take away sin. No, you take your son. By the way, Romans, we think about Romans a lot. We should. Romans begins by saying, I've been set apart, Paul said. He, he signs his name at the start like they did. And he said, Paul, an apostle of, set, a, set apart for the gospel of God, which concerns his son. His son. Be sure and talk about his son when you tell the gospel. I remember I was talking to a friend who I hadn't seen in years And I ran into him in a hardware parking lot, hardware store, you know, and this was years ago. And he told me where he lives over at the coast, and I was over speaking at Cannon Beach, and I had a free afternoon, and I just drove up to the high school where he taught and surprised him and uh, caught him after class, and he invited me over, and I remember all evening trying to communicate the gospel and not getting too far. As we were catching up, you know, and I was telling him the beauty of the gospel... But his little son, about two years old at the time, was running around before they put him to bed. And I said, you know, and I began to talk about God's gift of his son. And I talked about his son. And he said, Scott, he said, now you're scoring. (laughs) And that's the way he used to talk. He wasn't always talking sports. He said, now you're scoring. And I could see it when I brought it home to the reality I want you to take your son. And then notice what it says. Your only son. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Your son. Your only son. Third point of correspondence. This wasn't just any son, was it? It was the only son. Second point. Third point, this was the promised son. Both the son of Abraham and the son of Abraham were promised beforehand. Uh, We jumped into the story. Look back at chapter 12. In chapter 12, when he called Abraham, he said, verse 3, in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, Abraham didn't have any sons, didn't have any kids, period. When he said, in your descendants, 
all the nations of the world will be blessed. Turn to chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not fear, Abram, I'm a shield to you. Your reward shall be great. And Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me since I'm childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. Since thou hasn't given me any offspring, one born in my house is my heir. And that was the custom of the day. Then, behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, This man, this servant in your house, will not be your heir, but one who shall come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside, and he said, Now look toward the heavens. And it was a night like last night. And he said, Count the stars if you're able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And verse 6, Abraham believed God. Abraham believed in the Lord, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Again, Romans starts, the gospel, which he promised beforehand through the prophets, concerns his son. Isaac was promised repeatedly, you're going to have a son You're going to have a son. And the Bible is replete with promises. We looked at the first one in Genesis 3, and there are hundreds of promises in the Old Testament. Both births were promised births. Both births were miraculous. Are you still there in Genesis 15? Look at chapter 16. Miraculous births. The Bible doesn't have just one miraculous birth. There's a theme if you've noticed. But chapter 16, now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. If you remember the Bible, if you read, you you remember the story, and I'll just summarize that sad chapter by reading the last verse. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. You remember Sarah's idea, maybe we can help God out, and the world is still suffering the tensions and consequences of that kind of sin today. Uh, Sarah was barren. Sarah was barren. Chapter 17, Abram was 99 years old. The Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. I will establish my covenant between me and you. And so... Abram said, oh, Lord, couldn't Ishmael, my son Ishmael by Hagar, couldn't that do? And he said, God said to him, verse 15, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall come from her. Then Abraham fell on his face and laughed. And he said in his heart, will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. But God said, no. But Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. This promised son was a miraculous birth. Just as Sarah was barren, 90 years old, so Mary was a virgin. How can this be? I'm a virgin. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you, and for this reason the holy offspring shall be called the Son of the Most High. All things will be possible to those who believe. You see this? likeness that the Holy Spirit is drawing, this miraculous birth. And then notice in our text again, he says, take your son, your only son, the son whom you love. He's not just a promised son. He's not just his only son. He is the son of his love. Your son whom you love, it's repeated twice. When Jesus came, did you remember When he came on the scene 
after 30 years, when he came on the scene, the heavens opened, the angels sang. But when he came on the scene publicly 30 years later, and he was baptized, remember the heavens opened. And the Father spoke. And he said what? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. This is my beloved Son. Twice he said it. When he took Peter and James and John up on the mountain, he said the same thing. A beloved Son. And then notice, fourth description of him here. Take your Son, your only Son, the Son whom you love, Isaac. Did you know that both of them were named by God? Sarah's going to have a son, and you will name him Isaac. Laughter, joy. Abraham laughed, said, can a 100-year-old guy have a son? Can a 90-year-old woman? Oh, that Ishmael. No, no, not Ishmael. Isaac. You'll name him Isaac. Both sons were named by God. I want him named Jesus, Yahshua. He, Yahweh, saves. He'll take away his people's sin. In fact, the prophet said, a virgin shall be with child. And sometimes we, that almost overwhelms us because it's such an amazing prophecy. But he said, and you will call his name Emmanuel, God with us. Well, look at our verse, verse 2. You take him and offer him there in the land of Moriah. Now, Moriah is only used twice in the Bible. It's one of these geographical places where you only hear about it twice. He said, I want you to take him to the land of Moriah, and I'll show you a mountain there. Well, the only other time it's used, I'll read this to you, Second Chronicles chapter 3. We were just at this scene recently on Thanksgiving. Second Chronicles 3, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord. Then the son of David began to build the house of the Lord in Jerusalem on Mount Moriah, where the Lord had appeared to David at the place that David had prepared the threshing floor. You go to Jerusalem, he said. This is before Jerusalem was even named. This was Mount Moriah. He said, I want you to take your son, the son of Abraham, to Mount Moriah. And he took him to the place where the son of David would build the house of God, the Temple Mount. You know, people talk about hot property. It still is, isn't it? It's the hottest, literally. The whole world still stays focused on that little plot where thousands of animals were sacrificed later that could never take away sin. You take the son of Abraham to Moriah. Both were offered up, both sons at Jerusalem. Herod's seeking to kill you. You tell that guy, I've got three days more. I'm headed to Jerusalem. It wouldn't be fitting. He set his face to get to Jerusalem. A prophet must die at Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I would have gathered you. But he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he offered himself at Jerusalem, the appointed place where God said. And by the way, at the appointed time. Remember this chapter starts after these things? Just glance back to verse chapter 21 because uh, he had said, or I shouldn't say 21, 18 again. Chapter 18, after these things had happened, remember in chapter 18, the Lord came to Abraham and said, at this time, verse 10, I will surely return to you at this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. At this time next year. It would be like saying December 8th next year. You're going to have a baby. I mean, this is miraculous. Uh, it's not like nine months from now or eight months from now. I, I mean, a good medical doctor could tell you, you know, close. No, he said, at this time next year, 12 months out, at a specific time. And I'm amazed when I read my Old Testament. And in that amazing prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, he said, when a decree goes forth to rebuild Jerusalem, 
There will be 69 weeks of years, 69 sevens, 483 years until Messiah will be cut off and have nothing. And this was given to Daniel, and after Daniel was off the scene, Artaxerxes, this Persian king, gave the decree in Nehemiah 2, you can read about it, in 445 B.C. to rebuild Jerusalem. And 483 years later, at Jerusalem, the Messiah was crucified. He was cut off. Even the appointed time, and whenever you think of a time... I love that little verse in Romans. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. When we were still helpless, at the right time, the appointed place, the appointed time, well, Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of the young men with him and Isaac, his son, and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go yonder, and we will worship and return to you. Here's where we start to see, I think more than any other type in the Old Testament, the heart of the Father in this The types generally point us to the Son, but this type focuses us on the Father also. And I'll just read it. He takes him, and he goes early. And on the third day, he had been living at Beersheba. And uh, from Beersheba to Jerusalem is about 50 miles, so it took about a three-day journey. And for those three days, Isaac was dead to Abraham. He'd been told to go offer him. Can you imagine as he purposed to go for three days talking with his son as he headed to Mount Moriah where he knew what was going to take place. Verse 5, when they got there, he raised his eyes on the third day and saw the place. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkeys and I and the lad will go yonder and we will worship and return to you. Ninth point of correspondence. There will be no witnesses to this. What's going to take place between the Father and the Son, there will be no witnesses. You remember when everybody was looking at Jesus and taunting him as he hung on that cross? At noon, the sky went dark. It was a supernatural darkness. You know, in Exodus, they talk about the darkness. You couldn't even see your hand. I believe God shielded what took place at the cross from human eyes, not even the two that were hanging beside him. And notice the faith of Abraham in verse 5. You guys stay here. We're going to go up there and worship, and we will return to you. He considered that God is able even to raise the dead. I know he didn't understand everything. He he was, I can't even begin to enter into what was going through his heart. But he said, we will return to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, And he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so the two of them walked on together. And Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. Tenth point of correspondence. Both sons, Isaac, the son of Abraham, and Jesus, the son of Abraham, willingly submitted to the will of their father. This was no mere lad. The word might kind of uh, throw you for a loop like he's a little kid. Uh, This was the word that was used of Joshua when he was 
in full-grown manhood. This speaks of, they'd lived a long time at Beersheba. They planted an oak. Uh, he's somewhere between 25 and 40, Isaac is at this point. We don't know exactly his age. We know a chapter later he gets married uh, when the servant goes and finds his bride for him, and he's 40 at that point. But Isaac willingly submitted to his father. Jesus said, I came not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Isaac carried the wood. Jesus carried the cross. Abraham, notice, look at verse 6. He took the fire and the knife. Something we don't often think of is when the, when, when the cross occurred, when Jesus Christ was offered, it says the Lord was pleased to crush him. Isaiah 53. The Lord was pleased to crush him. He was forsaken of man and smitten of God. They walked on together. And Isaac said, Father, here I am. He said, Behold, we got the fire, the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? He asked that. And we know another one who hung on the cross and said, Why? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there was no answer as he hung there. Heaven didn't answer back. It was stony brass silence. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Isaac says, we got the stuff. Where's the offering? Listen to Abraham's beautiful answer. God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. God will provide for himself the lamb. The gospel was proclaimed beforehand through Abraham and to Abraham. Verse 9, then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. Words fail me to even comment. Moses, and I should say the Holy Spirit, is a master storyteller. But as you get to this point, what can I say about it? He raises the knife. He's got his son on the altar. Matthew Henry, the old Puritan, said, Oh, be astonished, O heavens, and wonder, O earth, at this. Here is an act of faith and obedience which deserves to be a spectacle to God, angels, and men. Abraham's darling, Sarah's daughter, the church's hope, the heir of promise, lies ready to bleed and die by his own father's hand, who never shrinks at the doing of it. Verse 11. We've seen many points of correspondence. Now we see a huge contrast. The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. And he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him, for now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Huge contrast. Just at the moment, the angel of the Lord spoke and said, don't, Abraham, don't. The greater than Abraham, the son of Abraham, no voice came from heaven. Judgment fell. 
No wonder we're still singing about it, the deep love of God for us, that he would do that. Be astonished, O heavens. Be astonished, O earth, that the hope of Israel, the heir of the promise, that this one would bleed at the hand of his father. Because you see, no man takes my life from me. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. The Father gave His Son. He sent His Son to a cross. He didn't just send Him to a baby in a manger. He came and humbled Himself and became man, always with the idea God purposed to give His Son for you and me. Can't overstate the contrast here. The Lord would not permit His friend to endure what he himself would endure. Stop, Abraham. Don't. And notice who said it. The angel of the Lord. If you've read your Old Testament, that is Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ, the Christophany. When they saw, when, when Samson's folks saw the angel of the Lord, they said, we've seen God. And they asked him, what's your name? And he said, why do you ask me my name, seeing that it is wonderful, full of wonder? We know who that is. This is Jesus even in the picture, who stopped it and said no, and then provided. God will provide, and God did provide. The ram caught in the thicket. There's a substitute. Isaac didn't need to die. A ram would die, but the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. This all points to the fact that I don't need to die, you don't need to die, someone else died. The son of Abraham died for me and for you. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in him. There is a substitute. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. The just one died for the unjust. Oh, I never tire of these great statements of the fact that someone died in my place. And that someone is the son of Abraham, the true son of Abraham. Verse 14. Abraham called the name of that place. He changed the name of Moriah. He called the name of that place the Lord will provide. As it is said this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abram a second time from heaven and said, by myself I have sworn. You see, God, when he swears, he can't swear by someone else because there's no one greater than him. And the book of Hebrews opens this up in chapter 6 and says, he swore by himself in order that by two unchangeable things in which it's impossible for God to lie. When did he do that? Right here. This is when he's quoting from Hebrews 6. I have sworn, because you've done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed all the nations of the earth will be blessed. Not through the blood of bulls and goats, but through his own blood he entered the holy place. This sacrifice, this substitute, and the gospel was proclaimed ahead of time. He reiterated the covenant that he said over and over right at this point, and he swore by himself. And Hebrews says, we have this hope, an anchor of the soul, because Jesus has entered as a forerunner into the very presence of God for us. Oh, this is the gospel proclaimed beforehand, beforehand. Now, I know, turn full circle. I want you to turn back to Galatians 3. This will be the final passage I want you to look at. Verse 6, even so, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure, it is those who are of faith that are sons of Abraham. 
and the Scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations shall be blessed in you. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Don't merely marvel at the story. At Christmas time, it's so fitting that we remember, yes, it's a marvelous story. Yes, we should marvel. Yes, the beautiful music that it creates, all this is only appropriate, but don't stop there. Be sure that you have believed. It is those who are of faith who are blessed with Abraham, the believer. All this pre-shadowing, this amazing story in Genesis 22 and the intricacy with which it foreshadows what really took place in the Father's amazing love, oh, we don't want to just stop and merely marvel. We want to stop and worship and believe. Have you believed? Romans takes the gospel and explains it, and right in the center of it, he places Abraham, a sinner, an idolater whom God chose out and said, I'm going to bless you. And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Have you taken your place as a sinner and worshiped him for being the substitute who died in your place? Don't let this season just kind of slip by. Today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, Father, 